Welcome to Amplifying the Patient Journey, a series in which we speak with both providers and patients about the clinical journey with the neurologic condition and what recent advances mean for patients, their providers, and caregivers. In this episode, Practical Neurology's Editor-in-Chief, Joe Resco, had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Siva Murugapan, General Surgeon at Chatham-Kent Health Alliance in Ontario, Canada, who shares his own experiences as a patient recovering from an ischemic stroke. He is joined by his wife and caregiver, Dr. Prema Sami, otolaryngologist at Chatham-Kent Health Alliance, as they both discuss their transition from physician to their respective roles as patient and caregiver in the recovery journey. Dr. Siva, please tell us about your your stroke, if you would. So it was way back in 2017. The month was September, and uh, I had just finished a very busy call. And the next day was an endoscopy day. Full day was busy. And I finished my cases about 4 p.m. And I was heading home. I wanted to go home and have supper. I was hungry. But then as I was approaching the elevators, I received a call saying there is a patient on the medical floor who needs uh, incision and drainage for a large abscess on her leg. So to me, what is one more case? Let's finish it and then go home. So I went into the elevator and I hit the up button rather than the down button, went to the fourth floor, medical floor, went and saw the patient, and indeed she had a big abscess on her leg, and and the nurse got the whole paraphernalia ready, and I've given her local anesthesia, and I was about to lance the the skin, when I suddenly felt that my whole head was moving, and the next minute, both the legs buckled, I couldn't feel anything. The nurse was so smart, she just pushed a chair towards me and I was able to fall into the chair and luckily the chair was cushioned. So it it took the impact a bit. But all the silverware, because of a surgical tray, all fell on the floor and it created a big ruckus. The next thing you know is a lot of nurses, other nurses came, they put me on a trolley and they wheeled me straight away to ER to get my TPA. In a great location for this to happen, as you mentioned in in your book, Um, and you were able to get that TPA right away. Within 20 minutes. Exceptional, no, no, no delays. How was your recovery? My recovery was bumpy initially. So after the TPA, I was able to move my left side. And then as a few days progressed, then I could feel that they were like completely paralyzed. So you had a right ischemic stroke. So they couldn't really find what was the reason for my stroke because otherwise I was quite healthy. But anyway, they put it as idiopathic as the cause, as usual. And uh, my cholesterol was slightly high, accepted for that age. But as I went into the rehab unit, from the ICU after three days, I started improving steadily every day. And it was a grand gala time when I was able to hold on to the walker and able to take the first step. My wife was there. She was taking videos and sending it all around the world because we have relatives everywhere. That was a a moment. Otherwise, as the days went by, I could see that I was having difficulty in controlling my urinary bladder, that was a big issue. Not the bowels as such, but the urinary bladder more so. Because when you get the sensation, you have to immediately go. If not, you're peeing your pants. So I had a condom catheter for a while, but then, you know, given time, things get better and I was able to control. Other than that, things got a little bit slow after that. I was there for three months. No, nine weeks. And uh, I was able to walk, but I was walking with a limp. One fine day, my upper limb movement just came just like that. Did not expect. I woke up one morning from the bed and I was able to lift my hand. I was wondering, how did this happen? You know, you do certain exercises regularly thinking, 
thinking and hoping things will go for the better and then one fine day everything comes together boom but he, this, this is recolle re recollection of what happened and i think it was not that quick okay it was a gradual progress right a lot of therapy and uh, it was heart wrenching initially when you know the uh, the occupational therapist asks you to do those movements with your hand and he's a surgeon and you watch him do those exercises and my his mother visited came flew in from malaysia and that's where we are originally from and she went home crying watching him do that so but from there you know it was like he said a steady progress but not like fast it takes time you know yeah it was a a long journey like but uh he was very motivated to improve and that is i think the singular important feature in a recovering patient if it, it your motivation to get better and the exercise and all that it matters a lot right yeah <laughs> And and that's a wonderful insight that you have being both physicians and a patient in terms of it's not a linear step-by-step -step process that you see on up to date that step one recovery, next one, you're <laughs> up and out. It, it's a gradual process, takes a lot of um, motivation and other skills. And it's not just another line or bullet point on a list of any other insights? From my bladder control point of view, I think there is a constant barrage of impulses, both excitatory and inhibitory. And here I was trying to, I, I realized that during the journey, and it is the inhibitory impulses. You can't just think of something to stimulate, yes, I can go to urinate. You actually have to think about, no, I have to control it now. You got to send more inhibitory impulses. For me, who has had a caudate nucleus stroke, which is in the basal ganglia. In the basal ganglia, I mean, it's basically for coordination. Was a little bit of a struggle there. That is what I would like to say about. No, I I sort of figured that you know, it's the inhibitory impulses that has to work. And Doctor Sammy, you were going to say something, I believe. Yeah, I, I mentioned his motivation, which is a huge positive, but but even though a person is highly motivated, the process of healing takes its time. You cannot speed it up. And, and Siva would attest to it because he was highly motivated, but it took its time, right? You know, and it and it's he's still healing, I believe. It's like He's it's six years, but he's still healing. You know, you agree? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's an important point. So there are some finite kind of outcomes, but then there are these other other outcomes that that um, are delayed or they, they they take longer. And we are talking about the physical. There is a big psychological component too, which is which is actually tougher, I would say, because I mean, being a high uh, performing surgeon and just at the blink of an eye, you you lose everything. And you, you know, the training to become a surgeon is so long and it's so hard. It is like a huge part of his identity. So he, you lose that, like that overnight, it can devastate people. It can make you depressed. It, it, so, I mean, that it, recovering from that is a big challenge too, you know, because he was like lost. He was finding what else can I do? What is my purpose? And that's a lot of that you'll read it in our memoir, you know, that search for, of course, he chose the difficult path to come back to surgery because it's so much part of him. And I guess it didn't help that I'm a surgeon too. So he sees me going back to surgery. <laughs> you know, that's a constant reminder. So he he wanted to come back and and he I'm so proud of him where he is today, you know.
In addition to the motivation and the understanding what was going on, uh, what role did you play, Dr. Sammy? You had the other social network. Your mother came to visit and family members. Um, what, what was your role in all of this and keeping spirits up? And I'm the other half, right? The spouse. Yeah. And uh, my mother-in-law traveled a long way, but you know, winter was coming. It happened in September. So she returned back to Malaysia in November. And and we immigrated to Canada. So it was just my two kids who were like in high school and university and 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 him. It's just the four of us. We don't have much family here. So I continued to work full time, but uh and also looked out for Siva, uh, made sure we had everything in place for him from the time of discharge, making sure the occupational therapist wants your house to be suitable for a person who, you know, has a disability, right? Those bars and I had to get somebody to walk through the house to make sure it's safe for him. And, you know, right from the get go, it there was all those things that needed to be settled to make him comfortable. We hired a personal support worker to for the day-to-day -to, -day to and uh, and and also to drive him for his appointments and things like that. So that helped. Um I mean there's we have a lot of friends and the psychological support from those friendships was amazing. But you know, this is a long drawn process so people get back to their lives so at, after some time it's just you me dealing with this and it, that can be overwhelming especially when I had a full-time job the key I felt and I can tell you looking back is just take it one day at a time because if you start thinking about, oh, what is he going to do? And how are we going to recover from this? Where is he going to end up? It's just too overwhelming. I, I think you should just do things, what is necessary at that time and take it one day at a time and 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 be prepared for the next step. That That's the best advice I can uh, give people who are going through similar journey, yeah. And uh, like I mentioned, the psychological aspect, if that he needed help, I would find a therapist. So me working full time financially, we could, you know, provide everything he needed. That that was important, too, because if I can only imagine somebody who was the sole breadwinner and they lost their job, it, the financial stress would be horrible, too. So we were lucky that way. Yeah. What about the support team that you hired? Were you happy with them? They were fantastic. They were there all, all the time. And, you know, mornings, I cannot take a break. That's it. Eight o'clock, they come in. By the time I come back to my room, is one o'clock and I'm dead to the world. Then I wake up at 6 p.m. So that used to be the routine, you know, every day. They were good. Once he got out of the hospital, they they connect you with the outpatient rehabilitation, you know, where they, he gets appointments for physio, occupational therapy. and But we top that up on our own, which we had to pay for, obviously, because he when, when your muscles are weak, he had some shoulder issues. There was some, uh, you know, like uh, not dislocation, but you know, like the shoulder issues, it was a sub, it was displayed yeah. a bit. So uh, we, we would make our own appointments to a chiropractor or go to an acupuncturist. And we did a lot on our own as well, uh, without the established uh, care teams within the healthcare system, you know. We even go got him into golf rehabilitation. He loves golf, so. <laughs> What's your handicap? That's a good question. <laughs> pre pre stroke, it was fifteen. Post stroke, the number is whatever you give it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about why you wrote this book. I, I I've I've read some of this, but I think that listeners haven't read the books. 
I think it's an inspiration. The motto being never ever give up. And I also want to tell the listeners that all the sayings that have been said in this world is very true. For an example, Dr. Sami said, take a one step at a time. It couldn't be more true than that. Practice makes perfect. All those things, you know, whatever saying you can think of, I think it's all true and I've experienced it. So I would like to say that to the, the whole world, like, you know, don't yeah. think it is just a saying, it is true. Well, the brainchild of actually wanting to write the book, I thought of it when, like, it was probably the second week after his stroke and in the rehabilitation floor, uh, they had a little library, so I used to go in and they didn't have that many books. And I, I found um, <clears throat> Kirk Douglas, is it? Michael Douglas' dad had a book, Stroke of Luck. I read that. It was It's not a very long book, but it was well written and that beyond that, not many. So I said, I told Siva, I said, I'll get you a dictaphone. You start talking into it, what, what you're feeling. We should write a book. And this was like the early days, right? He didn't do anything. But like I was not, book. I was not, I was not emotionally in a place to do that. Yes. But then about, about a year after where he was a, a little bit more motivated I said, why don't, so I started looking for somebody who would, we can talk to, like a ghostwriter. And we found this wonderful person and who became a very close family friend. And honestly, it started off by talking about our story, of course, to inspire people and all that. But those sessions was like therapy. It was amazing to be able to empty your feelings and and he went through a lot of challenges coming through because he wanted to get back to surgery and you would find that in the book because our college doesn't make it easy you oh you want to be a surgeon prove to us you can do that safely and then how do you prove that you have to get a surgical colleague to assess you so all that process oh, it tore us apart you know it was so hard and um, we talked about all this to this writer, right? So it was, that was like therapy. We paid for her time, but it, it was more valuable than that, you know? And, uh, but everybody who has read the book, they not necessarily had a stroke, but whatever people go through, the emotions, the challenges, People can relate to it, whatever struggles you go through life, whether another medical illness and 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 that's what we want to reach our audience. You know, we all are similar in our struggles. And, you know, if you can relate to something we went through, then it's well worth <laughs> the effort. <laughs> yeah. Universal experience that you're describing in terms of <laughs> one hurdle after another and even some some more hurdles in terms of trying to restore the dis surgical dexterity and, and returning to practice is amazing congratulations that's that's yeah. incredible uh, how has the reception been to the book so far well it, it's been good but what i have realized is the writing the book and the publishing is the easy part the marketing way out of my league. I, it's a total whole different ball game. I've learned so much in this whole process. I know so much more about the process of publishing. And I think even though we don't have a bestseller in our hand, I think uh, I got educated in a different area outside my skill set. So I, I look at it positively. So we bought uh, directly from the publisher a bunch of books and locally we live in a small community in ontario so uh, our foundation has uh, is uh, uh, promoting our book and 25% uh, of the sales goes to the stroke fund and we've sold about 300 books locally and we are having a signing next week in in the city uh, in a, a a bookshop which launches new authors and we'll see how that goes and uh, of 
online, I have social media, everything authors are supposed to do, right? Our author website, social media. I don't know how many books are getting sold through the distribution channels until I see my royalty. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not holding my breath, honestly. It's it's. I don't think uh, how if people know you wrote a book, it automatically translates to sales, right? You know, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. This was but it, not. It for them. But if it touches someone and they learn how to survive their own struggles, that then it's yes. important. What could other physicians? learn from your your stories here on, on from both of your sides yeah from a physician point of view you know i was told the first two years is the year where you can get good recovery and after that it just slows down but i think most of my recovery happened after that and i think the recovery is this neuroplasticity is like learning a new skill and we can't put a time for it. It can happen anytime. It just takes your will that whether you want to learn it or not. So I would urge physicians not to say that, you know, the first two years are when the full recovery will take place. After that, it's going to slow down. And another thing I wanted to point out is during the early days of uh, after a stroke, depression can easily set in. And there's a lot of debate about whether to give uh, SSRIs to increase the serotonin in the brain. I would fully recommend SSRIs. It, it keeps you upbeat to do things. That's exactly what you want to do at that time rather than emotionally being pulled down. So I would definitely say SSRIs help. It helps with the behavioral activation rather than the spiral cascade type of type of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Is it's your question about what we would tell uh, our phys physician colleagues about the stroke recovery, about or about being a physician and getting a stroke? No, <laughs> no about stroke recovery that often patients are reluctant to share some of the negative factors with their physicians they only want to tell the good news or of course you have the extreme cases where nothing is ever right right but i think that what you described was a good example of expand the margin of that two year it's not two years and done that it's a longer process and it's individualized and that it takes a lot of resources emotional physical what have you i think also uh when you're out of the uh, healthcare setup and your home uh, having a community uh, with in with uh, people who have had st strokes like in in our community there is a organization new beginnings and you going there you meet other patients i think it's like that for any disease whether it's breast cancer or multiple sclerosis that community connection is also very important to share those challenges and difficulties right so i think it's solace in numbers <laughs> yeah <laughs> strength in numbers i love it strength and solace in numbers i like that you mentioned one in your area is there a another group that you could recommend or another resource for patients as well heart and stroke foundation okay quite active in our communities yeah is there anybody else yeah the you know there are a lot of physiotherapists who who self promote on on the internet people can also use that they're pretty good what is the thing i used in my hand oh yeah fit me, fit me yeah. yeah fit me so we got all those things for him to practice at home yeah <laughs> yeah how is surgery going for you now that's that's an amazing accomplishment I would like to say that, you know, when I first started after my stroke, even to do minor surgery, it still involves the basics of surgery. Everybody, I can see a lot of eyes on me. Can he do it or can he not do it? And you got to go through. That's not physical. That's just emotional, you know? Yeah. And that emotional thing, even if you know something to do well, you will screw it up. 
Yeah, looking. under the microscope, right? Like, no, who looks good under the microscope? Come on. <laughs> so, like, I'm a surgeon too, but he he's got a natural flair for surgery, and he was one of those surgeons. I can do anything. I can, you know. He he. he so for somebody like that to go through what he did, like, and he was going back, trying to go back to surgery, he he lost a lot of his confidence. You know, that was a huge hit. And I could see that because I knew how he was before. And you need confidence to to be able to perform. And and everything you need to prove yourself through a, the, this journey you are under the spotlight, you know? So that was really hard. And 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 not everybody is in your quarter, right? Not all your colleagues are supporting you. Some actually disappoint you, you know? Uh, so a lot of emotions, you know, and disappointments and betrayal and, but what is meant to come to you eventually does, I guess, you know, you have to keep, going and trying and proving yourself and and if you keep doing it and keep doing it you get better and today he he does like 15 skin cancers and he's tired but then I'd be tired too maybe more than him you know? uh, when he started he used to be wiped out but his endurance has improved so much you know <laughs> this concept of tiredness in post-stroke patients I beg to differ actually you know, after I was discharged, I went to the OR to assist a surgeon to see how my endurance is. We started at 8 o'clock and we finished at 7 o'clock. That is the first time I'm going back. And then I was thinking to myself, what are these guys talking about endurance? You know? That's adrenaline. There are, there are some old concepts which need to be reviewed, I think. But fatigue is a problem. But fatigue too. is well known. But I was I was expecting the fatigue. I was like, you know, trying to say to the surgeon, excuse me, I, I think I'm done. But that didn't happen. Like You had those <laughs> surgical re reserves. I was going to say earlier that, you know, a general surgeon covers a very big area. Not to disparage uh, Odo, but... <laughs> no, no. Yeah. And they deal with more sick patients too. So their their job yeah. is uh, highly stressed and um, uh, their psychological makeup is a little bit, you know, more go, 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 you know. So I think he used to get wiped out. I, I knew he was tired. But he is so motivated and positive, he wouldn't even admit it to himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're both very um, uh, welcoming with your time and you're so upbeat. And uh, thank you for sharing your story. Is there any last comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I would like to say for somebody newly diagnosed with a stroke, we have to, somebody has to tell them it is going to take time and you have to develop this patience no matter what, that things are not going to come easy and it is a struggle, but with patience and with time, things will happen. Try not to analyze. That's the other thing I want to tell. Try not to analyze everything, why this didn't happen, why it took so long. You know, stop all that. It will come. Blind faith. How do you tell somebody have blind faith? In the Western world, we, we, we want to analyze it. We want to know how to do it. So it's going to be really difficult. Can't rush it. You can't rush the process. Yeah. Yeah. Trust the process. Trust the process. Yeah. You can't rush it, but trust the process. That's a good saying. Yeah. So as a, the, a caregiver to the stroke patient, I would say you, you just have to support them physically and psychologically and take it one day at a time just be there for them you know and <clears throat> sometimes it would seem like the stroke patient is only thinking about themselves you know they don't understand there's a whole world outside that there's a work to be done there's family and uh but I had to be patient too and there were some dark days difficult times but uh 
it 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 tests your relationships too you know but prayer finding other outlets i learned how to paint you need to support yourself too you know i i always thought i was awful at art and i just picked up a brush and a canvas and and found, here, I and found out that i actually can paint <laughs> here i thought i was the stroke patient and i will develop some other abilities no it's the caregiver <laughs> Thank you to Dr. Siva Murugapan for sharing his story and knowledge with our listeners in this episode of Amplifying the Patient's Journey. And thanks to you, our listeners. Be sure to visit practicalneurology.com for more podcasts in the neurology field.